Hey everyone, and welcome back. We've got Kurt Sand, uh, General Manager of DevSecOps at CyberArk. Yeah, thanks so much. It's really fun to be together. I wish it could be in person, but this is the next best thing. I, I know you've been meeting with a lot of uh, chief security officers, uh, development teams. Um, what are they sharing with you? I mean, what does zero trust mean actually out there in the real world in practice? Yeah, I'd say, first of all, that you know, there's no one tech you can buy, you know, you can't just go buy your zero trust in a box and call it done, right? I think that's even why we're here as partners. You know, it takes multiple technologies, multiple processes to get to this goal of zero trust, I think is really how I hear our customers talk about it. It's, it's sort of the, the ideal outcome. You know, I think if we look at a more practical definition, you'll see people thinking about, look, let's, we can't trust anybody that's either inside or outside our network mm -hmm. anymore. And what the heck is the network per perimeter these days? That in itself is kind of like fuzzy. Um, and how do we actually, something shows up and wants access to a system. And if we don't trust it at all, how do we actually authenticate it and give it access? You know, one application of it we, we have here in, in sort of our world of secrets management, which is about securing, getting to that zero trust goal for apps, might be the way we can hash an application, right? And store the hash in the vault. Now the application shows up and says, hey, let me have a password. We'll rehash it and say, does the hash match the one we think it should? And if it doesn't, we go, whoa, some, something changed in your code. It might have been malicious. I don't know. But either way, I don't trust you. So it's about really, I think, having that strong authentication as a way to um, start from zero trust, but then you can't keep zero trust forever and nothing will ever get granted. So much of zero trust is about people getting access to systems. But of course, that's like actually less than half uh, the story. Uh, there's the, the Beyond Corp model, which, yep, was that zero trust network access of me as a person getting access. But then there's this rest of the world, the real world, of course, of, of all the applications, the services, the clouds, the machines uh, that are talking and working with each other. Is that something, too, that, that you're seeing, you know, security leaders starting to talk about? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think... The definition of uh, what is an identity um, is what continues to, to broaden. You know, there are humans and humans come in multiple flavors, right? They could be admins, they could be workforce, they could be customers. Um, but then you go beyond the human identity and totally agree with you. Now you get into what we might speak of as machines, but then mm -hmm. machines, there can be applications, physical devices, there could be bots, yes. there could be the DevOps tools. So there's a really wide definition of what is an identity when you start to think about identity security and how we secure them aiming towards that zero trust goal. So as security professionals, um, particularly too, I mean, you work with, you get to see developers in action, you know, you know a principle just of every app that you're building has to have identity built in. It's not just the identity for the customer, but it's actually the, the identity for the app, the service, the cloud, um, really, really important. We think about, okay, but if we're gonna make this work in the real world, right? It, it still has to be easy to do. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you make things sort of obnoxious or, or painful, then people will start trying to find their way around it. So right. I think another big part I hear customers talking about, you know, make it easy on my developers or make MFA easy. Give me multiple ways to like identify myself, like just right. make it part of my day, but don't make it kind of an annoying part of my day is what I, I hear a lot of discussions. So it, it sounds like you've been uh, talking to a lot of uh, chief security officers. So wh where are, are you seeing, where you're talking, you know, actually guiding them to spend, you know, their energy to what's, what's important for them to focus on? Yeah, you know, I guess because I come from the bias of the solutions I offer, right? But I tend to get called in when somebody's worried about application secrets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our focus there, it, it's really taking a risk per perspective. I, I find sometimes 
people can get a little bit suckered into thinking that the most important secrets are the ones in their most important applications. But the truth is you could have, you know, a $30 million mobile app or a five line script, right? Maybe one's worth a penny, the other one's worth 10 million to you. But if the most, you know, privileged credential is actually leaked in that five line script, it's the place where the hacker is going to go. So I spend a lot of time with CISOs thinking about it. Let's let's focus on it from the risk perspective mm -hmm. and then look at your total landscape of machines or in my case, applications and say, OK, you can't solve this entire problem overnight. So let's get a priority list based upon where we believe the risks are and let's start ticking away at those risks. And it seems like once we switch it to a risk discussion, it sort of starts to make more sense of an ongoing program aiming towards a goal versus just thinking right. you could flip a switch and say, I'm done. How are then those security leaders translating, communicating uh, risk in the language of to developers um, as they work with them? How are they doing that? You know, a few different ways, I think. One is you can look at a particular secret and understand how privileged is it. More privileged it is, probably the higher the risk is. You can also look at what system does it grant access to? Is that a, mm -hmm. is that a system that's of higher risk or lower risk to us? So that's sort of the way to get some flavor in. Now, maybe you're also asking how do you get developers to care, right? Yeah, you know, that's the secret think, everyone wants to know. Yeah, and I think, you know, developers, they inherently want their applications to be successful. And if the second they deploy it, it gets hacked, they're not gonna think of that as success. So it's a lot about just showing people examples of like what goes wrong when you don't do this right. And then they'll sort of catch on to, all right, let's go do this a better way. Yeah, I like that success of their application. That that definitely motivates them. And I think what we know too is making it easy for them uh, also motivates them. Something that I think it's new for us in, in security, um, that idea of fast, secure all at one time, you can go faster, but our job is at the same time, it goes faster, make it safer. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I think the key is to, I try to say, meet developers where they are. And what I mean is developers live every day at work in a development environment, a set of tools that they use to create software. And if you can meet them in those tools with native plugins, native integrations in their documentation, you know, it will just become part of their daily life. If you make them feel like they kind of have to stop what they're doing and go somewhere else to find or get security, they're just right. less likely to do it. Uh, you just, you have to, you have to meet them where they are. So that secret. could sound, so it could sound a bit scary. If I'm, as we think about to the future as a, as a security professional, which is Hey, last time I checked, there are like 20 you know, engineering tools, orchestration, you multiply that times cloud uh, platforms that our engineers are talking about. They're like bringing up a new one every day. How can we get together with development teams, ops teams to at least find some kind of common, I, I call it love. I mean, it, because otherwise it's, it's pretty scary. It sounds like there's a encyclopedia of everything, you know, we're going to have to work with. And is it that way or is there some other path to love? So a few things come to mind for me. One is, yeah, there's a large and ever growing landscape of technology. I suppose that's our Course, responsibility of vendors to keep an ecosystem of rich integrations viable is what makes us valuable to our customers. Hmm. But, you know, the tech is not enough. There's, there's still humans in, in the creative process here, right? And I think it's the same thing that breaks down any silos between humans is have a shared goal and then have frequent and open communication. And if I think about the shared goal, we mostly share the goal of wanting to have happy customers. I suppose if somebody on your team doesn't want to have a happy customer, you might want to rethink that team member. So shared goal yeah. comes around making our customers happy. Then the Frequent open communication, I, I choose those words carefully because open, okay, transparent, right? We're not holding something back, but I think it's the frequent part that we tend to still mess up. 
You know, we talk to each other only when we have to across DevOps and security or at the back end of a project or only when there's an audit failure, right? If that's right. not frequent communication, that's like communication in a panic, you know? So, you know, I hate to use the buzzwords of shift left, but I really, in my mind, what it means is like frequent open communication during the entire development process, I think is where, I don't know if it will create love, but it will definitely create a better outcome. Um, wrapping up, what, you know, if you, you, you're uh, talking to security teams, you've got a great team there at uh, CyberArk, what are the new risks, threats on the horizon that we need to pay attention to? Yeah, you know, I'm not so sure if it's new, but it's still frustratingly unsolved, perhaps, is, man, we still have an enormous amount of hard-coded secrets out there in the world. Mm. And, you know... And there will be more as we, as we move on more and more clouds. Uh, you got your secrets manager out there, here, there. So, so yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I see people first, you know, you got to get rid of hard-coded secrets. We all know we need to do it, but it's shocking how few people actually give the right attention to it. Um, and then I would say when I start to look at cloud, it, it's it's really, yes, it's, it's sort of like this for me. The generations of tech, we keep building new and great things, but we never retire the old, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the quantity is not only growing, but also the variety, right? And how do you tame that quantity and variety problem? I would say it's always going to have to be some form of automation. There's, there's just mm -hmm. no way we can manually deal with the number of secrets, certs, keys, go on and on and on across all of these generations of tech and more to come. It's about automating these environments and also you know that's the other place to bring back developers the second a developer sees a mundane task that they have to repeat over and over again as soon as you automate it for them you're talking their language right. they're like all right, right cool i don't have to do this anymore it's automated right right well that's exactly so i think uh spot on there which i think too as we work with developers and things we've been talking about here at the summit actually draw your architecture have an architecture, it's on paper, you can show it to a developer. And we've been talking to a lot about the idea of, of a control plane. So a common set of services, common set of patterns um, that can run everywhere. So Kurt, thank you very much for joining us. Great to see you. Thanks everybody, bye for now.